So today I'm happy to introduce you to Kathleen Richards. She is going to talk about how to start a property management company. She is the current owner of Landlord Source, a company that offers customizable systems that save property managers hours of time and costs involved in creating professional forms, manuals, documents, checklists, interactive systems, and newsletter articles. She is also a certified professional coach and founder of the Property Management Coach. Not only that, but she has also served at the local and state level on the boards for NARPM. Hello, Kathleen. Thank you so much for your time. You've clearly accomplished a lot in the property management field. With all that I just said, uh, did I leave anything out? Uh, the only other thing I would say that is probably important for our listeners is that um, I was a broker owner of my own property management company for over 13 years. And so I've been in the trenches um, from the very beginning through to the point where I sold my company in um, the very end of 2017 and stayed on through um, half of 2018 during the transition. Got it. Okay. So you, you've literally touched on every aspect of property management, whether it be owning your own company or helping other people improve their, their own company. Yes, so absolutely. That's, that's yeah. exactly why I want to bring you on because no one better to speak to than someone who's literally walked through the trenches. Um, so I'm going to get into it. We have a list of questions we want to go through. Make sure that you can, you have the time to answer for everybody. Um, so what are some tips that you would give to someone that's looking to start their own property management company? Uh, basically to make sure that they get started on the best footing possible. The first thing I would say to somebody, and this is kind of the coaching hat coming on, um, but is to know what your end game is. Like what kind of business do you want? Where do you want to be in a year and five years, 10 years, and then kind of back into it. Um, do you want to build a company and know that you're going to sell it? Or is this going to be handed down to your kids? Or is this something that you're going to build and knowingly step back from at some point in time and have your employees run the company? So if you can project out your ideal life and what that looks like around your business and how your business supports that, then you can kind of back into what do you need to do today to reach that goal. Um, it'll save you a lot of headache and time and um, working a lot of crazy hours and realizing this isn't working for me and then you're having to switch everything up. The other thing I would say that, that people probably really need to do in the very beginning is some basic market research. Who are your competitors in your market? What are they doing? Where can you, you know, are you going to offer something different? Or are you going to offer something similar, but what's going to make you unique is maybe your price point. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important to know your market research and what the competition's doing. And then the other thing would be to get really clear around what services are you going to offer and then get your foundation in place. And we can talk more about what are those foundational things you need to do operationally to, you know, have to, to be able to essentially hang your shingle and say that you're in the property management business. Got it. Got it. And it, when you, when it comes to doing market research, what are, do you have any tips on, on how to say quickly get into that? Yeah. So I did it every at least every other year in my marketplace because I wanted to step on what my competition was doing and make sure that I was staying relevant, okay. right? So a couple ways. Um, if your name is kind of known in your market, um, you may want to hire a student or get a family member um, to call on their cell phone so it doesn't pop up with the name of your company or something like that on it, right? Okay. And, and look at... Um, this is where it's important to know what kind of business you want to have, because if you want to ultimately be a thousand doors and be the big behemoth in your marketplace, then you're going to want to do market research against those companies, right? Absolutely. If you want to be a small boutique company, then you're going to do market research with similar companies, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to be comparing apples to apples. And so the best way to do that is you just, you know, you get somebody to help you. They call up those companies um, 
you can, you know, students are great because they can say they're majoring in business and they're working on real estate and how different companies run or they're majoring in marketing and, you know, would they be willing to send out their marketing information? So there's a whole variety of ways you can position it or you're calling around for your grandparents who have rental properties and you're helping them gather some information about different companies, right? Yep. And then just get them to send it to your home versus a business address. And then once you get it together, then you can kind of see what's the pricing, what's the services being offered. The other thing that was always really shocking to me, and I'm in a, a small market, little coastal market, mm -hmm. was the, I was going to say quality of marketing materials, but it's more like the lack of quality marketing materials yeah, yeah. Uh, and and you know the easiest thing you can do first before you even start calling people just go to their website you're yeah. going to be able to gather a lot of information from their website and i i remember one local company their website was literally one page static super old um they didn't have any portals for tenants to pay their rent online or for owners or i mean it was just super old Yep. I own personal rentals myself. And so I'm looking at it going, would I ever use that company? Probably not. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing you can do with your market research, if you're not really known in your market is walk into their offices. That'll give you a lot of insight into, are they organized? Yep. Do they come across as professional? Um, I know when I first bought my company, I went into a, a couple different colleagues offices in a different marketplace than mine. So they wouldn't feel threatened. And it was really interesting. One company um, projected being extremely professional. Yet when I went into their offices, it looked like a bomb went off. I mean, there were files piled up on people's desks on the floor. And I remember thinking, Oh my God, I would never hire this company to manage my properties. I mean, they are just, disorganized and all yeah. over the place right yeah, they so, can't take care of their own office that is little chance they can take care of your rental property yeah and so you know those subtle things um if you call and leave a message do they actually call you back people used to say to me all the time when i would call a lead back oh my god i've called five people and you're the only one to call me back okay really um, that's not really best practices for how to run a business but unfortunately, in the property management industry, um, we get busy and, and people spend money to get leads and then they don't even follow up with the leads, which to me is mm -hmm. kind of crazy. We, we so, see that all the time. We, we yes, the time. yes, you got to return your phone calls. Yeah, you, know? and you should be calling back within 20 minutes of the lead reaching out. Um, ideally, you should pick up the phone the first time, but if not, at least at a, at a maximum of 20 minutes, you need to be following up with those leads. And you know what I found that was very interesting, and I know we get busy, but when I would get a lead that would come in, a lot of times I would call them probably about four o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> or 4.30, and I would just let them know, I, I want to acknowledge I got your phone call, yep. I am heading out to show a property, or I'm meeting with another client, is there a time tomorrow that we can schedule so that I can, you know, focus on your needs, really hear what you're looking for, be able to ask you some more questions about your rental property. And people were always a okay with that. They didn't feel like I was brushing them off. And generally they were like, sure, and we'd make an appointment for the next day. And then I could call them and we could have a nice conversation versus mm -hmm. what I think a lot of people do is they jump in their car and as they're driving to their appointment, they return the lead and now they're talking on the phone with that person and maybe rushing and maybe not really listening to their needs and pain points. Mm -hmm. And people can feel that on the other end, right? Yeah. So we all yeah. want to feel like we're getting good customer service and, and that the people that we're going to partner with and work with really hear us and understand us. So even if you just do yeah. that quick, I'm just acknowledging I got your call. Definitely. That goes a long way. Definitely. You don't necessarily have to call them and, and start selling to them right away. You can call them to set up a time where you can actually speak and listen to them and have a dedicated time where they can actually let you know what their problems are and see if you guys are a good fit for each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, so being a, a property management coach, what is, are some of the most common mistakes that you see newcomers in the industry make? 
Um, I'd say the first mistake, and I already touched on it a little bit, is just not having a goal, right? Yep. So what happens is many times they're realtors and their clients are saying, hey, can you manage this? And so they kind of jump in and, and not really know what they're doing and, and figure out that they'll figure it out on the run, right? Yep. Um, that's not an advisable approach. You should really know what your goal is so that you know if that client's a good match for you or not because you don't want to start building up your business. Now you're attracting all the wrong clients and now you're spinning your wheels. And then three years down the road, you realize that you need to fire half of your clients because they're just sucking up all your time and energy and you're not making any money. So yeah. I can't emphasize how important it is to really know what your goal is. Then the other thing I see where people make a mistake is they don't have a plan. Okay. Um, and they take everyone that comes their way because they feel like I can't afford not to take them. And my response to people for years is if they're not the right match, you can't afford to take them it's because gobble. they it, will gobble up all your time. And, and it's not the right match for you. And then eventually you're not meeting their expectations. You're going to get frustrated that they're not valuing what you bring to the table. Right? Yeah. So, if you know what your ultimate goal is and you sit down and you think clearly about what are your ideal clients like and then you you start to put in place you know your your website and so now you're using words on your website that are going to attract your ideal client right and your marketing yeah. materials reemphasize yeah. that then you're attracting the people that you want to work with and then it makes property management a really lovely business to be in. If you're attracting the people you don't want to work with, it becomes a business that just beats you down day in, day out. Because much of what we do is problem solving, right? And so, yeah, we expect to problem solve with the properties and tenants, but you don't want to be always problem solving issues with owners, right? Um, and then ultimately you close out the account and you're refunding them, you know, money that they gave you just to make them happy and go away. That's, that's not how you run a profitable business. So, yeah. you know, those are some of the key things I see where people make mistakes in the beginning and yeah. they don't have any of their paperwork in place and they don't really know their pricing and they don't really, you know, they just haven't thought it through. Um, they kind of jump in with both feet. Um, that's where most people go wrong. In regards to pricing, when you're first starting out, do you recommend, say, being the lowest priced company in town so that you start getting a bit of cash flow in the door? Um, how, do you, how do you differentiate yourself when you're first starting out? Because you are going to have competition in most markets. Um, and obviously, your competition is going to have referrals that they can send to new leads. It makes it much easier to, to get new clients. But when you're first starting out, you have absolutely no referrals you can send would you recommend competing on price? How would you sort of approach that? Okay. So I'm kind of sounding like you're beating a dead horse here. Or I'm beating a dead yeah. horse. You need to know what your objective is, right? Yeah. So if you want to be the sort of company that does everything virtual, you don't have a brick and mortar building, um, everything is online and you want to, you know, do economies of scale and you want to get up to a thousand doors then that model lends itself easier to a low price point, okay? Yep. Because you don't have as much overhead, right? Maybe yep. you're using virtual assistants in the Philippines or Mexico or other places to help with a lot of the operations, people side of things. So again, your costs are lower, so you can afford to offer 5%, 6%, 7% in the marketplace, right? Yeah. If you are in, if, if you want to be more of a small boutique, you like being hands-on, you want to have a little, you know, office that people recognize in your marketplace, you know, you're going to have yourself and maybe an assistant or a property manager. There's at least two of you in the office. Now your costs go up. So realistically, it's going to be hard to be the lowest price person in the market. Yeah. Okay. Could you... So, Take the approach of starting off as the lowest price in the market, maybe start off, say, working from home, and then further down the road, transition, increase your fees, 
when you when it comes time that your expenses start to increase or would you yes, sort of recommend staying away from that and just knowing what you want right away you can do that but i still think it's better to kind of know what you want yeah. so like i knew from day one i wanted to be the creme de la creme the cadillac of property management boutique in my area okay yeah. when i bought i bought an existing company and some of the rates you know monthly management fees were five uh, six seven percent Mm -hmm. Oh my God, you know, and my rents were really low and I had a bunch of properties that were crappy properties that I ended up closing out because it just wasn't worth my time to manage and I wasn't making any money off of. Right. Okay. And so what I found is that I preferred to go after the higher end properties that could command higher rent that had less maintenance. The owners looked at as an investment were willing to put money back into it versus those owners that maybe owned a bunch of lower end rental properties really didn't care about the type of tenants they had in there they just wanted to suck the money out of the property and then you're arguing with them every month over maintenance right yeah. and so then you get a lower quality property i don't want to say a lower quality tenant but you're getting a tenant that's willing to accept deficiencies in a property, right? Yet yeah. they're, they're not going to pay a premium, obviously. So for me, my whole thing was, I want to make as much money as I can the easiest way possible with the, the least amount of effort, so to speak, right? Yeah. So that's why I targeted the higher end. I also knew from day one when I bought my company that I was going to be selling it. And so it's easier to sell a company that's very profitable and has a lot of positive cash flow than it is selling a property with a bunch of crappy properties in it. So again, I knew what my goal was from day one. And so that dictated all my decisions going forward. Got it. So back to, back to what we, were, we started with, you really need to know your goal when you're first starting out, what you want in terms of your, your company, essentially what your end goal is and what type of lifestyle you want. Um, and yeah, because if you're someone that's that says, okay, you know what, I've done property management for a while. Um, I'd ideally like to, you know, work 20 hours a week. I only, you know, I can do that. I don't want to have any employees. I can do that with maybe 75, 80 properties um, because I want to start having a family and be able to stay at home. Absolutely. Okay, well, you can do that as long as you know very clearly that you can manage yourself 80 properties. So you want to make sure then that you're managing 80 really high end properties and state instead of 80 low end properties. Right. Yeah. And, and then you can just stop right there. And as, as properties close, you bring on properties, but you always hover around that 80 to 90 door thing. And that's perfect for your lifestyle. Maybe once your kids start school, you say, okay, great. Now I'm ready to amp it up and bring on more. You know what I mean? So yep. that's why I say it's really important for people to kind of spend some mental time. And I know people think that that's not work. You know, you're not doing something, but you really are. Spend some mental time yep. thinking about really what you want your life to look like. Because I cannot tell you how often I get two types of people that come to me in coaching. Those that want to start a property management want to do it right from yep. the get go. Okay, great. That's the ideal. Then the other half of the people come to me and they've been in it five years and they're flaming out and they're working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they're like, I thought at this point I'd be backed out of the company and blah. And they're just, they're spinning their wheels and they literally are flaming out. And they're at the point of, do I just sell this to somebody else? Do I get out of the business? And I'm like, oh my God, no, it's such a great cash cow. Let's, let's figure some things out and get you back to a place where you have a life. In what newbies end up doing is they build the company and then they build their life kind of around it yeah. instead of building their company around their life. And so uh, that's absolutely. the whole point of if you're clear about what your objectives are, then you can build a company that supports the life you want instead of you on this, you know, wheel, hamster wheel, just trying to keep this company going. That's totally become like Medusa and is out of control and you're just trying to contain everything. That's yep. not where you want to be after five years of blood, sweat and tears. For sure. For sure. It's, uh, 
building a huge company sounds nice, but if it means that you're working a hundred hours a week and can enjoy it, there, there's something to be said for that. It's not necessarily right. as great as it sounds in theory. Right. right? So for, I definitely agree with that. You, you got to know what you, you want and go after it, but you have to sort of approach it in a smart way that it's not going to take over your entire life. You have to, like you said, build your business around your life, not the other way around. And one thing I'd like to say real quickly is um, a lot of people that start property management companies come from the real estate sales side. And so what happens is in the real estate sales side and just from like a, a disc personality or personality assessments, yep. um, top salespeople, personality characteristics are 180 degrees different than top high producing property management owners. Yeah, and yeah. part of it is on the sales side, you may work your leads. Um, typically when you get that property that gets listed, it's going to be in contract 30 days, maybe 60 days at the most, because the markets tend to be very tight. Yeah. And then once the deal's done, you move on to the next one. So realtors, real estate agents are used to being on the phone, doing a deal at 10, 11 o'clock at night, working things at all hours. Property management is a day in, day out. You know, you think of tortoise and the hare. Real estate agents are the hares and property managers are the tortoise. You are in it for the long game. You are going to be dealing with that owner month in, month out for hopefully 10 years. I had clients with me for 30 years almost because I bought a 20 year old business, right? Yep. And they came with, and you're dealing with tenants. If you're lucky, maybe they stay a long time and you have tenants for six to 10 years, month in, month out, your vendors. So there's no way you can be working at 11, 12 o'clock at night. And, and the realtor people don't understand that, right? Property management's more nine to five. And it's like a doctor's office or an accounting office, right? So it's a very, very different approach. And sometimes people just completely miss that. They're treating their property management business how they do their sales and you can't. Got it. That's, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Yeah. Um, that, that's a very good point. I definitely agree on that end. Um, when you're first starting out your company, what would you say are some of the main aspects that you should be focusing on? Would it be uh, marketing, your operational? What, what exactly would you say is the most important thing to focus on, say, in, in the first year of business? Yeah, I would say um, right off the top of my head, what are the services that you're going to offer? What's your pricing? Um, and then you need to get your systems and forms in place, meaning do you even have a management contract? Do you have your lease set up with all the addendums? And I know that sounds obvious, but I can't tell you how many people don't even have that. Really? Yeah, they just, because people are calling them saying, hey, can you manage my property, right? Or their sales clients, you know, they just help them buy a uh, fourplex. Can you manage it for me? And now they're calling me going, what do I do? What do I do? Right? They don't, they don't have anything in place. So you need to know what you're going to offer. And in the beginning, I, I tell people kind of keep it simple. Don't try to offer everything. Decide, are you just going to do full management? Are you going to do full management and tenant placement? And then over time you can add additional services, right? Yep. You don't want to offer too much and then you don't have the infrastructure to support all of that. Right? Mm -hmm. So Figure out the services you're going to offer. Figure out what your pricing is going to be. Are you going to be the same as your competitors? Are you going to be maybe a little bit more if your competitors in your marketplace are really low and they're just trying to get quantity? Maybe you actually go a little bit higher and what you are offering is that hand-holding ultimate customer experience. Yep. Okay, so Just because you're new doesn't mean you have to offer the lowest price, right? So kind of figure out where you're going to fit in there. And then you need to have your basic management agreement forms. Um, what's your lease addendum is going to be. Um, you need to have some basic operational, like your accounting, what's your property management software going to be, mm -hmm. right? Just some very basic things so that you can at least, you know, a marketing piece that you could hand out to people, right? Yes. Um, should have your website up and running. It can be basic. It doesn't have to have a ton of stuff, but yep. you know, you need to have some basic things before you kind of 
hang your shingle as a professional property manager? Agreed. And we, from a marketing standpoint, in your first year, I would say that you, you should really be focused on building relationships. Um, so yes. in your first year, going heavy on, on networking, going to, going to real estate investor meetups, um, trying to build relationships with other realtors out there that can offer you referrals. Um, and then, like you said, have a basic website. It doesn't need to be over the top at that point. You just need to get something up on the web that looks professional um, and really start focusing on building relationships to start basically bringing in some new contracts. And I can't, yeah, I agree with you hundred percent. I can't emphasize the building relationships because that's what property management is, is a relationship sort of business. Yep. Um, I, I spent virtually nothing on advertising over the years. My business grew through a referral and my best referrals actually did not come from realtors because they see you as competition, especially okay. if you do sales. I did not do sales. Okay. Yep. Um, but my vendors, you want to make sure you go out and build relationships with your vendors ahead of time before you need them so that when that emergency call comes in, you're not trying to get somebody to respond to you, right? Yep. So go out and, you know, ask other people in your area um, who are good, you know, plumbers, you know, maintenance people, contact them and say, hey, I'm starting a property management company. I'd like to build a relationship with you. Um, okay. This is how I work. You know, do you have insurance? That's huge. You don't want to be taking on vendors that don't have insurance. So start to build those relationships. And I can tell you, um, think outside of the box too. So people that I got a lot of referral business from, my carpet cleaner. Really? He referred a ton of business to me because he's going into vacant units to clean it and he'd strike up a conversation with the owner okay. saying, oh, is this a rental? Oh, do you manage it yourself? Oh, we, you know, yeah. forever thinking of hiring property management. So I got a lot of business from my um, flooring carpet cleaning guy. I got business from my flooring company that installed vinyl, hardwood floors, laminates, all that. Okay. carpet. I got a lot of business through her. Um, I also got a lot of business from CPAs, yep. right? Cause they do taxes and they know of their clients who has rentals and who might need more write-offs. Right. Yep. Um, also estate attorneys, because when they're creating a trust for somebody, they also know who has rental properties, right? So think outside of the box beyond just trying to partner with a realtor, which isn't bad, but you know, you want to be creating those relationships in a broad spectrum, join networking groups, BNI, LATIP, leads, all those sort of things. Um, Cause the more people you can talk to and they get to know you, people like to refer business to people they like. Do you and have, so, yeah, that's, that's a great point of really building those relationships. Do you have any tips in terms of building those relationships? Like what would you do? To, to build a referral program with say the uh, local CPA or, or would you reach out to multiple CPAs? How would you sort of approach that? Yeah, what I did, um, cause that when I moved over to my market, I was new. So yeah. I literally just looked up all the estate planning attorneys. I had my little flyer and I called them and made appointments and swung by and introduced myself and what I was doing. And I'd like to you know be able to refer my clients to them. Because just because you manage rental properties, what I discovered over a period of time is a lot of my owners did not set up trust. And so I used to put on a seminar, um, a workshop every year where I'd bring in professionals and have them talk to my owners about the importance of setting up a trust. So I'd have my state attorney, my CPA, my contractor, and all these people. And I'd invite my clients to come and to bring their friends with them right? Okay. To this free seminar. So yeah, lots of different ways. Um, vendors, anytime a vendor would refer somebody to me, the biggest thing that I found over the years is a thank you gift because you can't give them cash as a referral, um, at least in California, because they're not a licensed real estate person. Um, okay. I would give my vendors um, gas cards. Okay. Like $100, 200 yeah, a hundred dollar, two hundred dollar gas cards. Okay. Because I know they'll use it because they're driving around construction vehicles, you know, vans that gobble up a lot of gas. And so it was just always a thank you for them referring business to me, right? Um, and so I'd always try to think out of the box of doing unique gifts. 
I didn't like giving money because people don't remember the money. But like if a client referred, and I'd always ask my current clients or new people I know, if somebody referred a client to me and I knew that they loved golf, I'd go buy them a round of golf. Okay. Right? Or, yeah. So when they're playing golf, guess what? They're going to remember me. For sure. They're not going to remember if I give them 200 bucks in cash and they deposit in the bank. I mean, nobody remembers that, right? Sure. So yeah, trying to think fun. of the nice restaurant, those events, things that they enjoy, um, is ways of showing appreciation they'll remember. Got it. Okay. No, that's that's some really good advice. Actually, I, I'd never really heard of not only going after realtors, but going after, like you said, the carpet cleaner, the CPA, uh, the estate attorney. Th those are all really good sources that are probably less tapped than real estate agents. Yep. And they're also a true extension of your business. Definitely. So like I couldn't run my business without all my vendors. I couldn't run my business without my insurance person contact, without my estate attorney, without my uh, home appraiser, you know, all these people, your owners will come to you and ask for referrals. Hey, I need this. Or, um, you know, as you start working with, you know, a lot of my clients were older, so then their kids started getting involved, right? And so then I'd have conversations with the kids about, you know, did your parents have you know, a trust set up for the property. Have you guys done this? You know, and although I'm not an attorney, I know enough to then refer them to somebody, right? So you become that expert that people then go to, and that's the benefit of having all these relationships. Got it. No, that's, that's a very good point. Um, once you, you sort of are, say, becoming a little bit more established, what do you think the first position you should consider hiring for is? And basically at what stage of the business would you recommend actually hiring somebody? Yeah, I, I get this question a lot. Yeah. And um, it's a good question. Um, generally, what I do is I ask the person, tell me what you love about the business. Okay. And so those people that tell me, oh my God, I love going out, getting the business, you know, I go, okay, so you like the sales side. They go, yeah, I'm, I, I just get so jazzed when I get a new contract and blah, blah, blah. And I go, well, do you like doing the paperwork side of things? They're like, no, I hate it, you know, but I have to do it. You know, it's part of running a company. And so I always tell people, you want to hire for what you don't like doing. Makes sense. If you're a good salesperson, then hire an administrator to do all the paperwork stuff for you and you go out and get the business. Um, Remember before where I said there are different personality traits for salespeople and property managers? Mm -hmm. In my experience, most property management business owners are more operationally oriented than they are sales oriented. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest thing I end up coaching them around is I know I need to go out and get business. I know I need to do sales, but I really don't like doing sales. It feels cheesy and I'm pushing stuff on people. And so that's a whole different coaching session with them. But for that person that's starting a property management company that tends to be more operational, then you, your first hire may be like a BDM. Someone that loves to do the sales, that's going to go out and get the leads and bring them in. And you're the one running the office and putting the processes in place and doing the accounting because that's what you love to do, right? So don't hire yourself. You hire what you what, where you need support and, and the things that you don't like doing. And as you continue to grow and you delegate and push down the things that you don't want to do anymore, right? Mm -hmm. That's what's going to allow you to be able to step back and have a business that runs itself. Um, there may always be things that you want to hold on to that you really enjoy doing because that's why you're in business. You know, it, it feeds you, right? Um, but if there's an aspect of the business that's just super draining for you energetically, you groan, you sit down to do it, and then you allow yourself to get distracted by, you use the excuse of, oh, I've got so much to do, and you never do these things. Mm -hmm. That's a clear signal that that's, you should hire somebody to do those things. <laughs> okay. No, and when you're starting out, people go, well, I don't know if I can afford it. So the next thing I tell people is you don't have to hire a full-time person. You could hire a virtual assistant. You can also look to your network of people. In the very beginning, I had friends of mine that were realtors. Okay. Now, how often are they doing deals all day long? 
They aren't. They have kind of a lot of dead time, right? Yeah. So I, I trained a girlfriend of mine and she would do showings for me when I would get busy. She okay. would go do move-ins and move-outs for me. She would go do um, my, my walkthroughs on my properties or my pet walkthroughs or inspections and things. So she would do a lot of things that would take me out of the office but she, you know, I could send her a list of the tenants' names and phone numbers and train her on a couple things. And then she was great, off and running. And I, we worked out a deal where I paid her her property walkthrough or, you know, she would do so many showings for me and then she'd bill me. Guess what? It was independent contractor. It was way less than if I'd hired somebody. And yep. it was during those peak times when I was stressing that there's no way I can do everything myself. And then once we got past the peak time, I was cool doing what I needed to do. So think outside the box again. You don't have to hire a full-time person. Look to who's already in your circle that could support you. And then secondarily, you know, um, beyond hiring somebody, start to set a, what do you think it's going to cost? Start setting aside money now and building up your little reserve and you're going to find out right away if you can really afford to hire somebody because you're going to either feel that pinch at the get go or yeah. you're going to say, oh, no, I've got room to hire somebody. If it's a bit of a pinch, just set aside what you can now. So it's almost like building up that Christmas fund. You have a fund for when you're going to hire your assistant and you start building that up so that when the time comes, you can confidently hire somebody and not be in fear that you're going to have to let them go after two months because you haven't gotten more properties. Sure. At, at one point in my business, I had enough money sitting in the bank to pay my entire payroll for a year. Yeah. So you're, you're, that's you're a lot, pretty, yeah. but I, I wanted, yeah, I mean, that's a lot, but I wanted the ability of my staff not to be stressed if we lost 20 properties because the market changed and all of a sudden a bunch of owners put it on the market to sell because they can now get their equity out of it. Right. Yep. I didn't want them freaking out that, Oh my God, somebody's going to get laid off or we're going to get our pay cut or something like that. So it allows me and my staff to weather the storm and it allowed me to sleep at night. And if I had a great opportunity when, when you have money on the side like that too, it allows you, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, Kathleen, I want to retire. Are you interested in buying my portfolio of doors? Yeah. I got the money there to put money down on the deal if I want it, right? Yeah. So cash is king. So even when you're starting out, you always want, you know, even if it's just 100 bucks a month, I know it sounds silly, but you just start setting aside some cash reserve. Definitely. I mean, you, you, as a business, you should always have some sort of cash reserve. It's just, yes. uh, it, it's healthy business practices and it'll allow you to sleep a little bit easier at night when you know, like if you're in the position that you were in where you know you can pay your staff for the next year, even if hypothetically you lost all of your clients, it, it, uh, it's definitely going to reduce your stress. Right. Um, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, so given the, the current state of the property management industry, um, we see that there's, there's new safe venture capitalists type of companies coming in the market. Um, there's increased competition. Do you think that starting a property management company is still a smart choice? Oh, absolutely. I love it. And I think there's, there's, I'm all about kind of abundance. I think there is more than enough business out there for everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are a lot of, you know, venture capitals coming in the market. There's big REITs coming in the market. There's developers now that are, which, you know, I thought of this years ago and it's kind of finally happening, but there's developers actually coming in and building new housing okay. in communities that that housing is not going to go up for sale. It's intended to be rental properties and then, prop, you know, they partnered with a, a large property management company to manage them, okay. right? So they're filling a variety of different needs out there, but I feel like there is always plenty of business because... The majority of rental properties, I think it's almost like 70% out in the market, is still managed by the individual property owner. Exactly. That's what I was about to say. Yeah. Like so there's I think if you tons look, of room uh, for business and it's a wonderful cash, 
how sort of business once you get your systems in place. Yep. Property management is also, even though people go, oh, it's crazy, there's always something going on. It is a very routine business. We do the same thing month in, month out. We collect the rent, you know, tenants, yep. maintenance issues. Much of it is predictable. There's very little that is a true surprise emergency. And even emergencies can be predicted. Mm -hmm. If you live in an area where you get like Florida or the South and you have annual hurricanes or tornadoes, guess what? You can predict that there's a certain amount of maintenance you need to do annually to prepare for those things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so there's very, very little that should ever be a surprise in the property management industry. And the more you can systematize, the better you're going to be. Exactly. The, the more predictable things are, the easier it is to scale your business. And I always tell people, you want to be proactive. You don't want to be reactive. Exactly. That's, that's some good advice. Um, would you recommend to someone who's first, let's say, looking to get started in property management, they're considering opening up their own company. Would you recommend sort of dip their toes working as a property manager for an already established company before becoming an owner? Or should they just sort of, you know, go, go for gold and, and start up their own company and learn as they go? What would okay. sort of your, your recommendation be on that standpoint? I love the idea of working for somebody to try it on to see if you even like it, right? So I was coaching a client that is a personal investor, has their own properties that they manage. Okay. And this person has a real estate license. Um, oh, which let me address real quick, because I get this question all the time, especially when people call me for coaching and they want to start a property management company. The first thing I ask them is, what state are you in? And are you licensed? Because people don't realize that in many places, you have to be a broker, not just have a real estate license, you have to be a broker to hang your own shingle in some states, okay? Yeah. Um, you can have a real estate license, but you may need to work underneath a broker Okay. And so that's kind of a whole different conversation because if you're working underneath the broker, then technically the broker owns all the contracts. And if you decide to leave, the broker gets to keep all those contracts that you brought in and you're going to be starting all over again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's yeah. something to, to think about. Um, some states don't require any licensing. Generally, what I tell people is um, my recommendation would be you still go ahead and get a license because okay. me as an investor or someone that owns rental properties, if I have a choice between giving my business to someone who's got a real estate license versus someone who does not, I'm going to give my money to the person who has the real estate license because that tells me that they think seriously about their profession. They're taking it seriously. They're getting educated. They're making sure they're licensed and there's consequences. If they don't do things right, they can have their license removed. That's if true. you're hiring someone that doesn't have a license, even though the state doesn't require it, if something goes wrong, you're just out of luck. There's no consequences to them at all. Definitely. Right. For, for messing up. As far as designations, so we spoke about licenses, but what about designations? I know that you have a few yourself, if I'm not mistaken, um, but professional designations like the Master Property Manager or the Residential Management Professional from NARPM, um, are those designations that you would recommend people go out and acquire? Um, I think designations are great. I think in at least with NARPM, you're not going to be able to get the designations in the beginning because part of the point system yeah. to getting your designations is you have to have so many properties under your belt and have managed them for X number of years. And a lot of people starting out just don't have that. But it's not okay. to say that you still can't take classes online because that'll add to confidence. Um, a lot of times I direct people to local property management groups in their area that sometimes offer classes. Okay. I know I, one of my past careers is I was a, a university professor. Okay. Um, I have a teaching credential, so I've always done my own curriculum development. And that's something I'm working on right now is putting together a series of like little boot camp classes that people can take and get up to speed really quickly without having to go through a year long, two year long process working towards a designation, okay? Yeah. okay? But once you have those designations, um, 
I plugged them all the time and I'm a big proponent because again, it, it makes you credible, the expert compared to other people in your marketplace, right? Um, and then going back to your original question about, is it worth starting from scratch or working as a property manager and trying it on for size? Um, I had a client that um, wanted to hang their shingle as a property manager. And so um, I was coaching this person along and they were very much an operations person. They weren't a salesperson. And so after six months, um, this person was getting really frustrated that they weren't getting business. Okay. And one day they said, to, and I told them, the route you're going is really long. I'd actually advise them to go work for somebody else. And I'll explain why. I think that's a great idea. But this person said something to me that was very insightful. And what they said to me was, I thought I would be managing properties and doing property management. What I'm actually doing, what my business actually is, is a marketing company. And I said, bingo. In the beginning, that's really what, I mean, you just got to get your name out there. You're marketing, marketing, marketing. And this person's personality was not a marketing salesperson. Okay. This person was a back office operations person. And so that's why there was this whole disconnect between growing the business, right? Yep. And so I like to tell people, try it on for size. Because one, you may discover that it's not what it's cracked up to be, or it's really not what you want to be doing. And now you've spent a lot of money buying a franchise or investing in you know your website and marketing materials and and six months without earning an income because you're out there hustling trying to make it happen and you just realize wow this is really different than what i thought it was going to be right yep. so try it on before you make that investment and now you're kind of you know think of it this way when you're dating you don't just go straight to the kill and say, will you marry me? I love you. I want to make the commitment. Let's do this. Yeah. Okay. If you do, the other person's probably going to turn and run because you're freaking them out that you might be a stalker or something like that. Right. So yeah. think of it like dating. I mean, generally you, you, you kind of dip your toe in the water a little bit. You like the person, you, you go out, you talk with them, you learn about them a little bit more if you like it. You take it a little bit further and maybe you kind of do that for six months, a year. And then you're like, wow, I really like this person. I can see making a longer term commitment, right? Yep. A business is a relationship. Okay. And, and it's one that you want to go in with your eyes wide open. Right. Um, and you want to know financially what you're getting into and all of that. So okay. kind of liken it to getting into a relationship with a person. The reason why I love the idea of trying it on for size is there are a lot of property managers out there that need help. You know, I hear it all the time, right? And so if you, the other thing too, let me back up. There are a lot of property managers out there that are in their 60s and 70s. Yep. A lot. My whole marketplace, I was the youngest property manager. Okay. So go learn and under their wing. The majority of people in my area, 60s, 70s, and they don't really have an exit plan. And so if you approach it that you go work for somebody and you're smart about kind of picking out who you might want to work for that's been around for a long time, they're getting up in age, you offer to that you want to get in the business, you'd like to work with somebody, you'd like to kind of mentor underneath somebody, you get to find out, first of all, if you like the business. Mm -hmm. And secondarily, you can kind of, once you get to know the portfolio, if it's a good portfolio, you like the owners, all of that. Now you have a decision. Do you go off on your own and start, okay, a business? Or better yet, you built a relationship with this owner and you can go to the owner and say, hey, I would like to buy this business when you're ready to sell. Let's put something in place now. Yeah. And if that person likes you and you work on putting your deal together where you pay them out over five years, 10 years, guess what? It's not going to cost you any money for a down payment, maybe a small amount, or 
they are getting a percentage of the revenue, you're getting a percentage of the revenue, right? Mm -hmm. And now they're able to slowly back out, you're able to come on board. It's a beautiful situation, why? Because you're probably not gonna lose any clients because they all know you, they all like you, they've all worked with you. Whereas when you buy a business outright, there's something called a clawback, and that clawback ensures that you're not paying for accounts that you might lose because yep. people say, oh, I don't know this property manager. My relationship was with the, the other person. I think I'll take it back and manage it myself. Or, you know, my family member is in real estate. They can do it for me, right? Yeah. That's what that whole clawback's about. So by working for somebody, trying it on for size, Okay, now you're getting paid a salary or an hourly rate, so you're getting money straight off the top. Mm. You're getting to learn best practices on their dime, so to speak. Yep. Okay, I, I did really it that related. way um, because I own my own rentals. I came out of Silicon Valley. I'd worked in the corporate world, and I relocated. And I didn't want to do the commute to Silicon Valley by myself anymore. It was just too much. And so I looked around in my little marketplace and, okay, what am I going to do? I'm at master's in business and I wasn't about to, you know, work at Starbucks for 10 bucks an hour. So I got my real estate license and then I did mortgages because my background is kind of finance and marketing. And yeah. everyone I knew kept saying, you should do property management. And I'm like, yeah, I like it for myself. I don't know if I want to do it for other people. Okay. Because most property manager business owners were kind of control freaks. We want to do it our way. And so I didn't know if I would be okay being in that middle facilitating, giving up control. So I went and worked for a reputable company. And within a month, I discovered I was in seventh heaven, found my tribe. I loved everything about it. Okay. And I didn't mind doing it for other people. I didn't end up staying with her because she was going to, she was in it a long time and she had no interest in selling. Okay. So what I did was I actually had decided I don't want to start a company from scratch. It's going to take me too long to build up my business in my marketplace. Um, and so I would prefer to buy somebody that's looking to retire. And I just happened to go on to Craigslist this was okay. back in the day, 2005. Yeah. Craigslist was still kind of new. And I looked under professional. And there was, and I wasn't even looking for me. I was looking for my sister that was looking for a job. Okay. And so I just happened to look what's going on in Santa Cruz under professional. And there was 20-year-old property management company for sale. Owner wants to retire. Okay. So Called them up. And three weeks later, I owned the company. Got it. Very cool. That is, right? Uh, so I like that approach because there's very little risk. You get to try it and see if you like it without making that big, huge financial commitment. If you find yeah. you like it, now you can decide, okay, I'm going to get my licensing to do what I need to do and either work for somebody and take over their business or I work for somebody for a while to learn best practices, how to do everything, get my pitch down, get my name known out in the community. And then I go off and I start my own. And then maybe you start going around all those realtors that have 20 properties here. And I can tell you most realtors hate property management. They only do it because they're offering a service to their existing clients. Yeah. And you go to them and you offer to buy their book of business. And you slowly start acquiring 10 here, 20 there, so that you're getting some momentum. Because it is really hard I have a girlfriend that started the same time as me and it took her 10 years to get up to about a hundred doors. And yep. I gave her a lot of my properties. Every time I closed out with an owner, I'd yep. call her and I'd refer my owner, go work for this person. She's great. So I gave her a lot of properties to help her grow her business over the years, but it's tough when you're doing it one door by one door. For sure. For sure. So I guess you would recommend purchasing an existing company over starting one from scratch. If, and you, if and you can, ability. and people say, but I don't have money. There's lots of people could talk to me later about how do I find it? How do I do it? If I don't have a lot of money, there's lots of ways you could structure a deal because most owners don't want a big wad of cash. Why? Because they're going to have to pay a lot in taxes. 
yeah. on that big wad of cash. So most owners actually like getting paid out over a period of time. So they get a stream of income and they're paying out less in taxes and it's less for you to come up with, but you want to make sure to structure it so that you're protected and so that the owner's protected and it's a win-win for both of you. Makes sense. Is lastly, for someone who's looking to start a property management company or someone who recently started a property management company, but wants guidance, how can you help them? And what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Okay, so there's two different things people can do. As you mentioned at the onset, um, I am the owner of LandlordSource.com and there are tons of great products, newsletters, checklists, um, documents, forms, policy and procedure manuals. All the products were written by professional property managers in the trenches, okay? And all the products were written specifically for the professional property manager. Okay. So right there, you're going to sell, save yourself a ton of time. The company used to be owned by a girlfriend of mine. She started in 2002 and she wanted to retire a couple years ago. And so I bought the company from her because I did not want the products to go away. I used all the products in my business over 13 years and I'm, a good writer and I had a lot of my own templates, but I cannot tell you the amount of time it saved me of just bam, having all that stuff there. I, in their word documents, fully customizable, you plop in your logo, put in your company name, bam, you're set, you're done, go. So go check those things out. Okay. Cause that's a great way to get your foundation of the basics that you need. Then secondarily is as a certified coach, there are tons of coaches out there for the real estate side of the industry um, and for you know businesses in general. But at the time I got into it, and I've had business coaches myself over the years with my company, um, and it was so powerful, the experience of how they were able to help me take my company to the next level, help me stay on track. It allowed me as a sole proprietor, I didn't have a board of directors to go to, to bounce my ideas off of, or when I was having challenges, um, I had really strict boundary rules. My husband's been retired 17 years, so I never came home and talked shop, never. Yeah. And so a lot of times, you know, I had my mentors or colleagues I could talk to, but a lot of times you don't want them to know if you're having issues within your company either, right? There's confidential things you want to keep confidential. So I sought out coaches and they were really helpful to me to bounce ideas off things and give me just direction. Um, so that's why I started. I went to school, became certified, and I started and focused my business on the property management industry. Mm -hmm. So I'm always available to, you know, I work with people that are newbies starting out. I work with people that have been in business a long time and they're trying to revamp and restructure and systematize things and maybe get to the point where they can start delegating and backing out of the business, um, preparing the company to sell to someone else. How can they optimize and get the most from their business? Um, and I do work with a lot of newbies, you know, putting together and helping them to figure out kind of what their branding and their messaging is going to be right. Mm -hmm. And what their package is going to be and how they're going to differentiate themselves in the marketplace and, and giving them the confidence, you know, I think a big part of it is just the confidence that you've got this. And yeah, somebody put together their first rental agreement. And then on our coaching call, they emailed me after the fact, can you review it? And I'm reviewing it. And there were all kinds of mistakes and things in there. And I'm like, has this already been signed? And they go, oh yeah, I did it two weeks ago. And I'm like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> so we need to make some changes, right? So then they had to go back and kind of do a change to the lease with their tenant or they had to do a change to their management agreement because there were some like really big gaping holes there that needed to be filled. Right. Yeah. So I think just giving that newbie person the confidence that what they're doing is correct. And I'm the difference between coaching and consulting with the consulting, that's where you're telling somebody how to do something. And sometimes the newbie, they don't know what questions to ask, right? You don't know what you don't know. So that's where there's times where I'm going to say, you need to do this and here's some forms to get you going, or this is where you need to go to get the info. Okay. Cause they just don't know. 
a lot of times my coaching is better in that you're asking lots of questions to the person to help them be able to build the company that they're going to love, be energized about, make the kind of money they want, be able to have the kind of life they want. So I'm never going to tell them you can or can't do that because every marketplace is different. We're going to figure out what's going to work for them. And believe me, over 13 years, I tried a gazillion different things. Some things worked in my marketplace and some things didn't, right? And then there were things I came up with that nobody else came up with that was a really unique thing in my marketplace that worked. So with the coaching, I want people to feel confident that they can have the life in the kind of company that they want. And Weird. so bottom line, if they want to reach me for coaching, they can go to the propertymanagementcoach.com and then landlordsource.com and my phone number it's an 800 number so it doesn't cost them anything 800-475-3084 and I'm always happy to answer people's questions there you go so there's no one better to learn from than someone who's literally walked the trenches if you're looking for help starting your property management company or getting your company to the point where you want it to be contact Kathleen. I'm sure she'd be a great job uh, basically get, helping you get there. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Really appreciate it. I know you've provided a lot of value for, for everyone watching this video and uh, we'll definitely have to do, some, do, do this again sometime. Thank you again so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to um, share what I've learned. Thanks so much. Take care.